Welcome to Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at our last set of notes dealing with dimensional analysis. What we're going to look at here is when we have a complex unit, um, so instead of really basic units like grams or meters or liters or whatever, when we have what we call a complex unit, how do we handle those types of dimensional analysis situations? So what we're really going to do is we're going to look at three different situations. The first one is when you have square or cubic units. It's not just a plain meter. And I know it's true that 100 centimeters equal one meter, but it's not true that 100 centimeters squared equals one meter squared. So when we have square and cubic units, what's a simple way to handle this type of situation? Well, we're going to follow the same process we always have. We're going to first look at our target. It's asking us for meters cubed. And then we're going to put set up a workspace and put in our given. In this case, that would be we have three centimeters cubed. Now, normally at this point, what you do is you'd say, do I want to keep it? But I want to mention something about a squared or a cubic unit. We're going to write it slightly differently so it's easier to see how we're going to end up handling this. So remember, a centimeter cubed is really a centimeter times a centimeter times a centimeter. And I know I don't want centimeter. So the very first thing I'm going to do is try and get rid of a centimeter. Well, what can I do with any metric prefix unit? Well, I can change it into the base unit. So just like we talked about in previous situations, when we have a metric prefix, I can always go to the base. So I can go to meters on top. And I do know that there's 100 centimeters in one meter. Now what I've done at this point is I've actually canceled out one of my centimeters. So technically what I would have right now, if I do the math, is centimeters squared meters. Well, that's not really what I want. I've got other centimeters I need to get rid of. So all you really need to recognize is if I did it once to get rid of one centimeter and convert one to a meter, well, why don't we just do it multiple times? So if I do it again, that will convert another centimeter to a meter. And if I do it a third time, now I've actually canceled out all of my centimeters cubed, and I'm left with meter times meter times meter, which is a meter cubed. So fundamentally, all I really need to do is realize I can do it three times. So at this point, everything cancels but what I want. So that must mean 3 divided by 100 divided by 100 divided by 100 should give me the right answer. <clears throat> In this case, that would be 3 times 10 to the negative 6. Now, I started with 1 sig fig. Either answer here is written as 1 sig fig. So either of them would be acceptable ways to do this problem. Now, if I had a squared unit instead of a cube unit, well, just stop right there. Only do two of them. And that would convert a centimeter squared into a meter squared. So that's the simple way to handle square and cubic unit conversions. Now the next one is when we have what's called a complex unit, hence my name today for complex dimensional analysis. And really this is about a hidden equality. When you get a very specific type of unit, it's actually a hidden equality, and you need to recognize it as such in the problem. So when we have something like 60 miles per hour, now that's what we called in first semester a complex unit. It's a ratio of two different fundamental or two different units, in this case, miles and hours. Well, think about it a second. What does 60 miles an hour really mean? Well, technically it means for every 60 miles of distance traveled, I've used one hour of time. That's an equivalency between distance and time in miles and hours. So whenever you see a complex unit like 60 miles per hour, what I want you to do is cross it off and write it like this equality. It's going to make it easier to see how we're going to use it in the problem. Because remember, equalities are actually conversion factors. They can be written as ratios in one of two different ways. So on the left, we could use it to convert from miles to hours. and On the right, we could use it to convert from hours to miles. So really what we have here is a bridge between two different fundamental types of unit, distance and time. And in order to go from one type of unit to another type of unit, we need a unit to bridge the two. And that's what this equality does, is it's a bridge between a conversion of time and distance. So first type of problem we're going to look at is when we actually start with the complex unit as our given. The density of gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter. What is it in centigrams for kiloliters? Now, we don't have any other number information, so we kind of have to start with our complex unit at the beginning here. And this is, once you get the hang of it, one that most students will do just fine on the test. But you got to see a couple of tricks to this. First off, remember I said whenever you see a complex unit, cross it off and write it as an equality. Because it's actually a hidden equality. And in this form, it's going to be easier to see we can write it as a ratio, either at the start of a problem 
or in the middle of a problem to convert from one type of unit to another type of unit. So write it like an equality and it's more, you'll be more prepared to see how you're going to use it in the question. Now, these questions are always going to ask for the answer as a complex unit. So as soon as you see this over here, that's kind of a dead giveaway as to the style of problem. So what we're going to do here is always going to have the same kind of feel to it when you see that's what it's asking for. It's asking us to find a complex unit in our answer. Now, first thing I want you to do is you write the target as a ratio. Now, our target unit, because we don't know what number is going to be in our final target answer. So what we're really doing is it's written as centigrams per kiloliter. I want you to see it like this, centigrams over kiloliters, because written on the left, it's kind of hidden that we need mass on top and volume on bottom because centigrams is a type of mass, kiloliters is a type of liters. What we really need is mass on top and liters on bottom. And that's going to be really important for us to recognize that when we go to do this type of problem. So first thing we do when we go to set this up is we're going to treat this just like a normal dimensional analysis problem. We're going to put our target, but notice how we've written it. We wrote it as a top and bottom ratio. And then we have a workspace. Now. At this point, we're going to do something a little bit different with our starting situation. Now, it said we had 19.3 grams per milliliter, and we changed that to write it as 19.3 grams equals 1 milliliter. So now you can see you can write it as a ratio, and there's a number by the mass, and there's a number by the volume. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at our target and see, okay, mass on top. So I want to put the 19.3 grams on top. And I'm going to put the volume on the bottom. So you're going to take the 19.3 and put it on top. And you're going to take the 1 milliliter and put it on the bottom. Now, if we haven't written our complex unit like this equality up top, you might not realize that 19.3 grams and 1 milliliter are what we really need to put in this spot over here. And for the very first time, we're actually putting something on the bottom down here. And that's because this is the first time we've had a complex unit that we need to start with. So that's really the key to this problem, is write your target as a ratio with something on top and something on bottom. And that's going to tell us how we have to put our given. Because technically, if they wanted kiloliters per centigram, I'd put the one milliliter on top and the 19.3 grams on the bottom. Now, the rest of this problem is something you've seen before, but there's one slight twist that we haven't had to practice. So let's take a look at where we're at. So we got 19.3 grams on top, 1 milliliter on bottom, and we're trying to get to centigrams per kiloliter. Well, first, we work the process. Do I want grams? No, I don't want grams. Now, could have I also self asked myself, do I want milliliters? Yes, I could have done that at this point, but I'm going to ask that question in a second, because it doesn't really matter which way you do this. It'll still work out mathematically the same. So I don't want grams, so that's got to go on the bottom to cancel. And remember, as a base unit, I can change it to any prefix I want. Well, the target says centigrams on top. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I know there's 100 centigrams in one gram. So I now have my valid conversion factor. And that's going to get rid of grams. And now I'm going to be in centigrams on top, exactly as I want in my target. So that part is done. Now I have to work on my second problem. I've got milliliters on the bottom, and my target says... I need kiloliters on the bottom. Well, how do I handle that? Honestly, just like we did before with one slight twist. Do I want to keep it? And I'm talking about milliliters. The answer is still no. I want kiloliters. So how do I get rid of it? And that's the slight twist. Remember, to get rid of something, we have to cancel it. Milliliters is written on the bottom. So if I want to cancel milliliters, I need to write it on the top. And now it will cancel. Now, what can I change milliliters into? Well, remember, as a prefix unit, all we can do is change it into the base. So I'm not getting to my final answer, but I'm getting a step closer. Now I need the numbers to make them equal. There's 1,000 milliliters in one liter. So now I've canceled milliliters on bottom, and now I have liters on the bottom. Well, do I want to keep liters? No, I don't. So that means I have to go one more step. If I want to get rid of liters and it's on the bottom, that means I have to put it on the top. And as a base unit, I can change it to anything I want. So now I can get to my kill liters on the bottom. Now I need my numbers that make them equal. Well, kilo means 1,000, so there's 1,000 liters in one kiloliter. So mathematically, if I take a look and take stock, I have canceled grams, and I'm in centigrams on top. I've canceled milliliters, 
and non-canceled leaders. And I'm left with kiloliters on the bottom. That means I have exactly what I want unit-wise in the right place. So that means this has to be my solution to the problem. 19.3 times 100 times 1,000 times 1,000. And to three sig figs, I end up with 1.93 times 10 to the ninth. And my units would be in my answer, centigrams per kiloliter. So that's how you handle a complex unit when it's your starting point. Remember, as a complex unit, it's easier to see how we're going to use it if we write it like an equality. And plus, it puts that 1 in there, and it reminds us, as an equality, we're going to end up writing as a ratio. Now, second method of complex units is when we use a complex unit in the middle of the problem. So it's actually going to become a conversion factor. Remember, anytime you see a complex unit like 19.3 grams per milliliter, cross it out and look, think about it as 19.3 grams per 1 milliliter. That's how we want to view it instead. Now, the difference in this particular case is we're given other number information in the problem. And when you're given multiple bits of number information, it's often confusing to see what you're going to do. Now, the first part of it's still the same. We look at what the question is, what is the mass? Well, that would mean I'm trying to get to grams. And I need a target. Well, I'm given 19.3, and I'm given 244.8. Which do I start with? Well, remember. Where the question typically is asked is where you're given, typically is found. What is the mass if the volume is 244.8 liters? I don't have 19.3 grams per milliliter. That's just a fact about the density of gold. What I really have is this volume, 244.8 liters. And my other number here is an equality that I'm going to use to convert in the middle of the problem. Because you can see my issue here. I'm starting with liters, that's a volume. I'm trying to get to grams, that's a mass. I don't have any simple, easy metric conversion to go from volume to mass. But that is exactly what this conversion factor does. 19.3 grams is a mass, and it's equivalent to 1 milliliters, and that's a volume. So that's our bridge between these two, two types of units. And that's really important to recognize up front here, because you'll see, I've got liters. I don't want liters. What do I change it into? Well, right here is exactly what we want to change it into. I need to be in milliliters to use that conversion factor. So I want to go from liters to milliliters. And at this point, like always, put in the numbers to make them equal. 1 liter is 1,000 milliliters. I've now gotten real liters. I'm in milliliters. Well, I don't really want milliliters. I want grams. And that's what this conversion factor, based on this complex unit, does for me. I know for every 19.3 grams, I have 1 milliliters for gold. And this will allow me to convert from a volume unit to a mass unit and finish the problem. So mathematically, that must mean 244.8 times 1,000 times 19.3 will give me my answer. Now, for the first time, I need to mention something here because I don't think we've ever seen this in notes before. Usually the number of sig figs we start with, that's a measurement with four, is exactly how many we want to end up with. And that's because almost all the conversion factors I think we've ever talked about are all defined quantities and defined as exact or have unlimited or infinite significance. Well, in this particular case, while the one milliliter is defined as exact. Honestly, that 19.3 grams, this thing right here is a measured value. The density of gold has to be measured. It's not an exact quantity. So that actually only has three significant digits. So one of the things you need to recognize for the first time ever in one of these problems, we're actually rounding to a different number than we're starting with. So most of the time, we're going to round to what we start with. But every once in a while, we get a complex unit like this that actually limits our significance. The one had four, but 19.3 only had three. So we've got to round our answer to three significant digits if we want the best, most correct answer. And that's the other method of doing dimensional analysis um, that is a little bit more complex than what we looked at before. Two of them deal with using what we call a complex unit, either as a starting point or as a conversion factor in the middle of the problem. And the other one dealt with how you handled squared and cubic situations. And that ends our look at dimensional analysis.